right, uh, good evening everybody. Uh, my name is Andy Sal. I'm a managing director here at Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, uh, we are delighted to be hosting tonight's uh, Hive event. Uh, seems like a, a, a great uh, discussion on, on store. Um, you know, the bank, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, SVB, we are um, effectively the bank for the innovation economy. Here in the U.S., we bank about half, more than half of the venture-backed tech companies and about two-thirds of the uh, investor community. My, my group in particular uh, works um, in our international offices, and that's actually where uh, I first encountered the Hive. Um, the, some of the new markets that we're in include uh, China and the U.K., where we have businesses. We have a business in Israel. And my team is looking at some new markets, which include uh, India and uh, Brazil, uh, other parts of Latin America, Russia, Turkey, and Australia. So, particularly in India and Brazil, we have uh, obviously cross connections with, with the Hive. So again, um, welcome tonight, I, and um, it looks like a great evening. Have a great uh, discussion. I'll be I'll be with you guys tonight, and look forward to meeting you over the course of the evening. Thank you, Andy. And thank you to all of you who came tonight to the Hive Team Tank event. Uh, if tweeting tonight, topic it's a Twitter, so you should be tweeting. So the you just go with a um, hashtag Hive Hive Data. The Hive Team Tank is a forum for thought leadership through our panel discussions, through our talks. We we focus on two things. These are entrepreneurship and all things data. These are just few of the speakers that were on the stage, on the high stage in the past. Since our inception, we have organized over 170 events with um, 200 speakers to our community of 8,500 people. Thank you to all of you who are here with us for the first time. How many of you are here for the first time? Wow. Great, thank you. And to all of you who are coming here on a regular basis. Oops. The next event is actually next Wednesday. The topic is API management with speakers from AP Apigee, Red Hat, and uh, Tipco. Upcoming events in the fall, it's going to be packed, uh, just to name a few. Uh, on September 15, a uh, talk by Professor Jitendra Malik. Then uh, uh, the next one in October, digital weaponization, industrial cybersecurity, and uh, and in November, uh, deep learning, NLP, the speakers from Salesforce, LinkedIn, and more. Uh, you can register for all these events on our meetup page, the Hive Team Tank, as you registered for this event through through the link provided on the top of the description page. So all of these uh, events wouldn't have happened without the uh, help of our partners and sponsors, so we'd like to give a big shout out to all of them. The Hive Think Tank uh, is brought to you by The Hive, what The Hive is, more from Managing Director and Founder of The Hive, Tim Ravi. Thank you, Sasha. First, I'd like to thank uh, Andy for hosting us and so Andy not only knows the Hive in Palo Alto, but has a close relationship with the Hive in Brazil. And it just happened that the Hive Brazil team was there today in the office. So thank you. Um, so the Hive is, is, a, is a venture fund with a difference. We are engaged with companies at the very early stage. So if you are an entrepreneur and, and want to use data to to create value, to drive disruption. We want to speak to you. So reach out to me, tmravi at hivedata.com. So, so the focus of, of the Hive is applications and use cases that leverage uh, analytic approaches, data science, and, and the, the kinds of data uh, infrastructure that you're going to hear from Kartik today to, to kind of create value in different verticals. And, and what is unique kind of about the uh, Hive is, is uh, we are engaged in very early stages in the company. We tend to sort of invest two to three million dollars in the company at the early stage. 
and work actively uh, with the companies. Our CTO is here today, Mohan Reddy. So we have, uh, and usually for a venture entity, a CTO, people with product focus who, who uh, get joined in the hip with entrepreneurs, uh, especially for the first five to 15 years. So the focus is on applications and use cases uh, around IoT, online, and enterprise. And <clears throat> here are some of the themes that we are uh, in, in particular kind of focused on. And so, um, Neva is an example of, of a recent company which is using AI and natural language processing to drive automation in the front office. So around service management, around support. Uh, it's no accident, you know, if you think about like Comcast delivers poor support or something like that, it's universal. It's not like Comcast is universally stupid or something like that. It's just the process is broken. And, and, and so, um, uh, the combination of sort of cognitive <coughs> intelligence platforms, uh, conversational agents, robotic process automation can bring a lot of automation in, in the field. So if you're interested in NEVA, NEVA is looking for people to just reach out to us. We also have a company right now that is looking for people that combine sort of three domains, IoT, security, and blockchain to address some of the new attack surfaces exposed in, in IoT. Uh, uh, we are part of uh, the conversation today, so uh, uh, use the hashtag HiData. Do you guys have a hashtag you want us to use? No, you can use HiData. <laughs> I guess if you all like to use, you can do hashtag. And, and instead of Facebook today, use Twitter. <laughs> so, uh, so with that, I, I'd like to introduce my friend uh, Karthik Kramaswamy. So Karthik is someone we've known for a long time, and and he has been responsible for sort of the analytics side of of Twitter, especially the real time analytics side. Uh, they will tell you. I won't tell you much about Helen, but they will tell you uh, a lot about it. Many of you have heard of Twitter Storm that came out about five years ago, maybe. And, and uh, Twitter stock really had a big impact in, in the market. And, and so, uh, and, and I don't know if that's the way they would describe it, but Helen is in some sense the next generation of, of that technology. And recently, Karthik and his team made it open source. And so it's really available to, to all of you. Um, Karthik uh, came, has done his own startups in, in the past. And uh, is part of a different mafia of ours where he went to school at uh, University of Wisconsin and did his PhD there. And so he has a kind of a, a deep background in, in, in the sort of data infrastructure that we're going to talk about today, but also in networking. So I think he also spent a stint at Germany. And so with that, I'd like to welcome Karthik. Today's um, uh, uh, session, we'll have a talk by Karthik, introductory talk on Helen for maybe about a half an hour or so. And so feel free to kind of ask him questions either during the talk or you can set them up for after the talk. But uh, very importantly, after that, we'll have a hands on demo. And so it should take about 45 minutes. So be as interactive as you like. Thank you. Mosong. Uh, he works with Nehran too, and Bill, he's also a uh, So, uh, like, I will give a kind of a first a few introduction about the uh, light introduction about what Nehran is and what how we use it every day. And uh, followed by that, uh, Bill and Mosong will try the hands-on session. So, without the, since there's not much time, I will just jump into the slide right away. So, if you have any questions, as Ravi pointed out, uh, Please uh, do ask during the course of the talk. And um, 
So I'll try to answer quickly as possible. Okay. So the first is, session is, as uh, Ravi pointed out, we have a kind of overview uh, that will just be the short introduction followed by hands on. So to give a talk offline of the 30 minutes that I have, first we will give a overview of what Heron is actually with a simple uh, tag introduction of the stuff, mm -hmm. followed by uh, what we do uh, with Heron in production, and we talk about one of the uh, issues that we face in production and how things that how we solve it. Can you mention the Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, we had a small uh, hitch actually because of, we don't have uh, internet access. So initially we thought we are going to so that we can download the software from the GitHub and uh, um, kind of try it out on your laptop. Uh, since you don't have the internet, we kind of uh, did a stop tab measure where we put it on the USBs and uh, the USBs are being passed around. Uh, if you have the, want the USBs, please uh, take, uh, go ahead and uh, Pass it on to others once you copy those files. Then um, also, do you have the airdrop? Yeah, we do airdrop. So we, if you want, you can do an airdrop as well. So we sort of create works for you. Okay. Sorry about that. So I forgot to say. So anyway, so then uh, I will discuss a little bit about the load shedding aspect of it and followed by some conclusions. So um, to give an idea about hand hold you, hand is a successor to storm. So. Uh, essentially, even though under the hood is completely everything is different from the storm architecture that we all know. Um, so, the Heron from the API point of view, Heron still has the storm API for obvious reasons because uh, uh, Twitter has a lot of investments, a lot of applications, and other things that we have been running in production for a longer time. And migrating them from a storm to the new system Heron should be as easy as possible, right? So, one of the uh, things that we did is just keep the API compatible. So, so from a terminology point of view, Heron has the same terminology as Tom itself. So, a topology which is nothing but a directed ACT graph. And uh, in the directed ACT graph vertices represents a computation, and the edges represents the streams of data that is flowing between those vertices. And there are two different types of vertices. One is called spouts, which are essentially nothing but um, uh, tapping the data from the sources of the, uh, for the topology. And some of the sources could be either the data coming from Kafka or it can be coming from Kestrel. And uh, at Twitter, we use uh, a completely a new messaging system called a distributed log, and uh, which is on top of it, which we built a new pop-up system called the Event Pass, which has much better guarantees than Kafka itself. And uh, so you can even use the regular database like MySQL and uh, Postgres as well. So then uh, uh, the second type of vertices is called bolts, and <coughs> bolts uh, take incoming couples transform them in whatever way your application logic is then for us then emit any outgoing tuples. And some of the typical operations include uh, filtering and uh, aggregation as well as join and any arbitrary machine learning function that you, your uh, logic, business logic or your real-time analytics logic would require. So to give an example of uh, how a topology looks like, is nothing but a DAG. So here in this case we have a couple of spouts. Those spouts in turn uh, uh, stream the data to the next eight bolts, and those bolts in turn does some kind of a transformation, followed by sending those data to the next eight bolts. So, why did we do here in the first place? I mean, I don't want to go into the details of all the problems that we faced uh, with the experience of Storm. If you are interested, uh, we have written a paper last year that was published in Sigma, and that is probably one of the highest downloaded papers in Sigma ever, I think, so far. So far, I think we are close to 23,000 downloads, I think. So that paper is pretty well, uh, uh, like a easy read. It's not a highly technical paper with a lot of math in it. It's just a simple practical paper. And uh, so I'm going to just give a three high-level reasons. Uh, one of the reasons why we did here in this, like uh, the performance predictability. So when multiple uh, uh, storm topologies were running together in a, a multi-cluster environment, in a multi-node cluster environment, each one was trampling other when the fragments of those topologies running on a single node. So this means we didn't have any way of identifying why one topology is lagging behind while the other is going faster because they were trampling from each other. So we wanted to solve that in here. The second aspect is like the improved developer productivity. So when you run strong topologies, debugging is a big uh, nightmare because uh, essentially all the threaded architectures that uh, each worker had uh, it will pipe all the logs, everything into one single uh, file, and uh, what you call if you're, well, one of the thread is emitting small amount of logs compared to another thread which is emitting a lot of logs, then you are looking for a, what you call a 
as a, like a needle in a haystack, right? So it's very difficult to debug. Then the second one is like um, how to assign some kind of resources. For example, if a disparate um, logics or uh, bolts and spouts are running together in a single worker, how much memory and resources you can allocate to it? So it's very difficult to do that. I mean, often we used to run into DC issues or probably over provisioning issues, all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, so one of the things that you want to do is improve developer productivity in terms of uh, uh, ability to debug things quickly and ability to do profile quickly as well as uh, the ability to isolate uh, the tasks between the processes. Then finally, like we wanted to give ease of manageability. Storm used to enforce the fact that you need to run a cluster of its own. Most of the deployments in Storm uh, were like a cluster of its own. On the other hand, a lot of um, new schedulers have come up, like Apache Mesos and Yawn, as well as Kubernetes and um, HPC community runs something called Slurm. So a lot of the new schedulers have come up, and uh, there's a community behind those schedulers as well. And those schedulers have matured to a point where it's all production ready. I mean, uh, Twitter itself, we run a lot of Mesos and we have open source Mesos, and uh, there's a company behind it right now supporting Mesos for people uh, who want to use it. And uh, so when we were running Storm, we were running uh, a separate cluster, and we were managing uh, several thousand missions on, on that cluster. And uh, it, was, it became a nightmare because uh, we want to get a topology from a, a development to production, it takes somewhere around three weeks because uh, when the topology is uh, uh, finished development, we try to find out how much resources that the guy will need. And uh, the base, because of the first problem of performance predictability, we ended up uh, uh, taking a path where every topology was scheduled on its own set of machines. So you have to calculate how many machines that you need, and based on the machines, you need to put a cap requirement and those cap team in turn will allocate the mission, and the mission has to be added into one of the schedulers, so that when the topology itself advertises itself, hey, this is my topology X, and okay, you're supposed to get like five machines. So it, this process was taking like three weeks or so, and that is uh, very frustrating for developers who want to get it into production with you. And of course, there are, this is a high level problem that I will explain, but there are more, there are totally, I, we identified around 19 to 20 problems. So, so now uh, with the uh, Heron, we uh, got away from the fact that uh, we don't need any more scheduler at all. Instead, we can be schedule, uh, we designed abstractions in Heron in such a way that uh, uh, it could be, what do you call, um, piggy, uh, piggybacked on any scheduler. So since the scheduler uh, is, uh, a lot of the schedulers are already available. So whenever you submit a topology, which is essentially your JAR or code, whatever the logic is, logic code, so it becomes a kind of a job for the scheduler. And the scheduler in turn runs the topology alongside other services that is running that's managed by the compute cluster. So that's what it means. Like you can run multiple server topologies, sharing the same resources, and uh, making sure those they do not exceed the resources. And uh, we use in order to make sure that the performance is predictable, we uh, use C group scheduling, Linux C groups, and so that we don't ex exceed the resources. And uh, uh, if you take a topology, if you dissect it, uh, it uh, has these several components, and uh, one of them is uh, what you call as the topology master, and the topology master runs in a, a container called uh, container zero, which is a special container, and um, the topology master is responsible for managing the entire topology. So unlike uh, Storm, where you have that one symbol uh, Nimbus, which is uh, uh, kind of the only single point of failure where you submit a job with uh, Nimbus fails, you cannot submit a new job and you cannot uh, relocate the fact, uh, failed fragments of the topology. On, in this case, uh, each topology is running independently of their own, and the topology master is the one that manages all the various data containers. So now the topology master, when, when it comes up, when a uh, uh, submitted topology, the topology master comes up in the container zero, then um, it calculates how much resources that I will need for this entire topology. So once it uh, calculates how much resources that we need in terms of containers, it requests the uh, scheduler, hey, by the way, I need 10 containers, and each container should be of X CPU and uh, Y amount of memory, right? So once you grab those uh, containers from the scheduler, then the, the, the data containers, which are the containers at the bottom that you see, are spawned off across uh, different machines. And um, these containers run multiple processes that uh, in turn interact with the poly master. So the first process that comes out of uh, the container is called a stream manager. And uh, that stream manager is especially when it comes up in, inside a container, 
it looks for where my topology master is at any given point in time. So, so the way it discovers its topology master, because remember all of them are running in distributed machines, right? So the way it discovers is like the topology master when it comes up, it writes it to a zookeeper saying that hey, this is the address that I'm available for this topology. And the moment uh, the team manager come up, they look at the place or they look at the node in the zookeeper cluster. The moment they get it, then uh, where the topology master is running, then um, they contact the topology master, hey, by the way, my container is ready. And uh, so similarly, uh, all other containers will report to the topology master. Uh, once, since topology most, uh, master knows how many containers needs to be spawned off, it will, once all the containers check, checked in with the topology master, then it constitutes something called a physical plan. So physical plan is essentially a way for each data containers to talk to each other. So, so which means like uh, if you want to contact the container A from container B, this is the port and the host and other things that you would use in order to send data to the client. So once uh, they have a um, uh, contact, uh, once they have a physical plan, the physical plan is stored into a Zookeeper cluster, and then the physical plan is shipped to the, from the topology master to all the containers, and those containers in turn uh, connect with each other in a, a fully connected graph and start exchanging data. And uh, so you might ask the question, why when a topology master fails, what happens? So it's fine, because the container zero, file, zero fails, since topology master has saved its state, which is actually constitutes the physical plan, as well as where the other stream managers and other things are running, if it gets scheduled in a different uh, container, in a different machine, it comes up and it looks up at the zookeeper and it rediscovers or uh, depopulates its state so that it doesn't lose anything. And the failure so far is uh, very like, uh, like uh, probably a couple of minutes at the max. So, so like uh, with that uh, uh, short introduction to Heron, I wanted to give some glimpse of what we do with Heron. Side. So some of the sample the topologies that we run ranges from something very simple to all the way to complex ones. As you can see, like at the uh, top um, left corner, you will see some few small topologies. On the other hand, like uh, people even do like uh, disconnected uh, graphs also. For example, as you can see uh, in the right side, um, you will see like uh, a graph which is kind of disconnected almost. Like you can split it out into three different jobs if you want to, but. For some reason, they just put squash them off and put together and writing. And the last two topologies, as you can see, they are very complex ones. And uh, for such topologies, we generate by uh, higher level frameworks like something where we have a, a DSL based um, API, and the DSL in turn generates this uh, all complex tag, and Heron can run any tag even this complex as this. So, Officially, uh, Heron has been in production for the last two years. I mean, before you even came out with uh, open source uh, three months ago, uh, it has been in production for more than two years. We uh, deep up a lot of issues, and it has been running stably for a long time. And even a lot of the business critical uh, apps related and uh, products related, everybody runs on top of Heron. Any streaming analytics, all of them runs on top of Heron. And, uh, since I can't give out the right numbers, but uh, you can trust that it's billions and billions of events are being processed by Heron. And uh, there are several hundred topologies that are running. And finally, like, um, like the job ranges from one stage to ten stages any, anywhere between the two. And uh, finally, once Heron has been put in production, Heron is known for speed. I mean, like uh, we still have a more room to further improve the speed of the Heron, but uh, what of the speed that we have is adequate enough for our uh, needs. But if anybody is interested in using it and if they want more speed, yes, there are a lot of optimization that we can do. That will probably give out a lot of time to do for us. Um, so because of the speed and uh, the CPU utilization is low, um, one of the things that we achieve out of uh, moving from Storm to Heron is 3x reduction in cores and memory. So essentially, like uh, uh, several thousand mission, 3x reduction is a substantial savings for us. From, uh, Operational point of view as well as the capex point of view. So this is an interesting one, like where what kind of use cases that we use. So we use for diverse use cases. So one is real-time VPL where you take data and transform the data into something that you would like to see. So we use it heavily for those. And there are several topologies that run those things. And real-time VI. So VI is actually like uh, what used to uh, be called OLAP or multidimensional cube kind of uh, analytics, but uh, instead of uh, doing lazy computation, we do a streaming based uh, real time VI where as the data is coming in, the fields are being continuously updated so that you can 
uh, data analysis about, uh, for example, one simple use case is like uh, us, uh, we monitor the piece of Twitter, or monitor the Twitter feed coming in. We all know uh, where the tweet is coming from, how it is coming from. We can uh, break down the based on uh, how much activity is happening in a particular country, uh, particular type of devices, particular type of operating system. So it's continuously being updated on a second basis. And uh, spam and detection as well as product safety. I mean, Twitter, like people abuse and uh, uh, do a lot of spam. So in order to detect those accounts continuously and removing them, all of them are done in the uh, uh, so. Then we also do compute real-time crimes. So as the Twitter data is flowing through, we keep computing trends and everything so that we can bubble up those uh, emerging trends um, so that you know, when the user sees all your, uh, what you call like, trending hashtags and all those things are to be promoted so that you can see the app itself. Then in addition to those uh, four different use cases, there's additional use cases in terms of real-time ML where we have a notion of model building and model enhancements, those are all done in the uh, as well. And we also use it for real-time media. For example, we extract the features out of images and other things. And using those uh, features, we classify the images. Those are also done real-time and runs on top of it. And uh, real-time ops data, so the operational data that we get out of because we run a big, big clusters, right? And the data coming out of those clusters are continuously monitored for mission failures or uh, impending failures, all those kind of applications also be done on top of it. So these are the uh, several buckets of use cases, but uh, there could be variation in shades of them. But uh, since we are running several hundreds of them, it's hard to figure out exact use cases until then. So then, uh, so I'm going to uh, talk about one specific thing that uh, we did uh, with respect to having what is called the back pressure. Uh, so it's it's about the uh, stragglers essentially. The stragglers are essentially a, a norm in a multi-tenant distributed system, and uh, they can occur for multiple reasons. One is it could be a bad host in a long, large cluster, and uh, or it's possible there is a data skew is occurring because uh, if uh, Twitter is known for its skew, like for example, if, uh, if uh, Obama tweets, yes, like 30 million followers will get it, right? So which means the tweet that corresponds to that uh, Obama's one will be going into the same machine, right? Because uh, because of all the followers that we have, right? So um, those kind of skews are very common. And uh, how do you handle those uh, skews in this present? Then the third one is like uh, inept and adequate provision. If you run a topology with not uh, enough resources that we allocate for it, then your input uh, rate is higher than the processing rate. So obviously you will stop lagging. So that's why the cost is stragglers. Right? So one of the various approaches to handle stragglers. So one is uh, senders to straggler drop mm -hmm. data. In the sense like, hey, that guy is lagging behind. So I cannot send the data to that guy, so which means I just simply drop it. <coughs> the second uh, thing is I will slow down for this uh, guy who is consuming, so that like a similar to some kind of TCP, where you slow down and go at the slowest pace of the slowest guy. Then the third one is like uh, detect stragglers and re reschedule them. So the first is the drop data strategy where uh, we silently drop it. Actually. So in this case it's very unpredictable and uh, it affects accuracy quite a bit. Then it has a poor visibility, especially in terms of uh, high scale and high amount of data throughput. You have no idea which one is dropping and uh, there have been instances where when we share some data with other partners, we used to see, hey, I'm getting uh, like 2x to 3x in accuracy. You have no idea where to look at it. So that's why we ended up uh, using uh, what you call a slow down the center strategy where everybody goes at the same pace. So this kind of provides better predictability, then uh, you can do recovery when uh, the straggler recovers back, you can process it the fastest way, right? And it nicely handles our temporary spike. And the computer is known for uh, several spikes during some events like uh, during Super Bowl or even football, when a touchdown occurs, boom, the, the um, tweets will go like 3x, 4x and come down, right? So we are known for spikes. So then the slowdown center strategy, like let's take an example where you have a linear topology where you have a spout which in turn feeds into the P2 and which in turn feeds into P3, both P3, then followed by P3 going to P4. And uh, so now the physical realization of the uh, topology when it goes into containers and uh, actually running in the uh, computer or in the server, so there will be like, let's say we have allocated four containers for it, 
And uh, within the container, as you all know, we have the stream manager, and all the physical plan has been distributed on the stream manager, and they were able to discover each other, and then you have a fully connected graph. And uh, you have these instances, which is where your actual spout and whole code are actually running. So in the, you take the case of uh, one of the containers where whole V2 is going slow. And uh, what happens is, like, uh, the steam manager in the container will uh, detect, hey, this guy is going slow. So what I will do is, like, uh, initiate a back pressure, let's say. In the sense, like, hey, I will tell the other steam manager, see, by the way, if you are sending me any data, please slow it down because the guy I'm speeding the data is uh, going slow. So now, uh, in, as a response to receiving this message to, from the stream manager, so which is the source of data in the topology? It's nothing but the spouts. Spouts are the one who's are constantly injecting data into the topology, right? So as a consequence of receiving all the uh, initiate back pressure message, the spouts, the stream managers will look at the spouts, whether there are any spouts in the container. The moment they see the spouts, then they just say like uh, shut down the spot, or rather uh, the steam manager will not take any, any more data from the spot. So this has the indirect effect of uh, facing the data within the flowing within the pod. And um, so so then when the uh, straggler V2 is, uh, comes back to a normal state, then we do another set of uh, messages called uh, relay back pressure, and then automatically the spot will be opened up. In order to make sure that this does not go into what you call a, a flip-flop mechanism where initiate, relieve, initiate, relieve, those kind of uh, behavior, we have a nice cushion of buffering inside the stream manager itself. So that buffer is uh, probably like uh, configurable and currently by default we provide 100 MB today. So if uh, I am lagging behind, if the stream manager data that is providing to B2 is lagging by 100 MB, then automatically the back pressure will be initiated. But when it drops down to less than 10 MB, anything to believe. So those kind of uh, things to believe. And this seems to work very well in practice so far without much issues. But of course, we do have a couple of issues. So, so in, back in the practice, what happens is uh, sometimes we get into these uh, slow nodes. I mean, it's not a failed node where uh, a container is running. It is a slow node because either some memory or some priority memory has been fired. So which means it's not going as fast as it should. Or probably if uh, the cluster is uh, so heterogeneous that we have a five or six <coughs> generation machine, and if some guy machine is some container is running on the latest machine versus another container is running on a sixth generation ago machine, obviously there will be a speed mismatch, right? So, so in order to uh, so what happens is when the moment we know that uh, somebody is back pressure, we know the guy who initiated the back pressure. And uh, for example, in this case, if uh, this is a container that is experiencing back pressure because some guys say the container is having issues. Then uh, what happens is, uh, since the spouts are all uh, kind of uh, pulled back, so your uh, read versus write um, from uh, messaging queues or whatever, you will start lagging behind. And we have a, a graph that, that shows that. So as we keep monitoring this graph, we know there's a lag behind it, then the topology is not pulling weight as it should be. So that is the, the key. Then what we do is, like if you know the container, what's causing the issue, there is a heron command which says, please restart this container. So with the hope that uh, the scheduler will find a new machine for the container, and everything will keep going. So without having to restart the entire cloud itself. So that's what we have a manually restart the container. So we are working on some special algorithms where this need not have to be manual. See, for, this is essentially a classical case of uh, real-time anomaly detection. For example, if you can get a lot of metrics coming out of these containers and the instances, if one guy is very anomalous to somebody else, then uh, we could uh, figure out that anomaly and say, by the way, please uh, shoot down this container and uh, please deal with it. So then it will be automatic without any manual intervention. So now, uh, the back pressure in practice so far, in most of the scenarios it recovers, but uh, without any manual intervention. But this sometimes uh, sustained back pressure occurs because it's either bad or quality goes, or some kind of a GC cycle is going on in the topology code that people have written, then uh, we have to go and find what is the root cause of it. Then sometimes you should just prefer dropping data. If they're slowing down for some reason, there are some groups within uh, Twitter. I don't worry about uh, the data getting accumulated for some amount of time. I want to be on top of real time always. Just drop it and keep going. So they just want to have an approximate view of the world in real time. 
So the tech in band 40 goes, so what we do is like if you have a hundreds of thousands of missions uh, in the compute cluster, so what we do is we run another Helm topology that is continuously collecting data from those guys and uh, telling what he called um, the scheduler, please blacklist these uh, guys so that you don't know to schedule anything on that. So this is a proactive protection of blacklist uh, as well that we do. And uh, so currently the Heron runs on uh, several environment. As I said, it's top API, and we also support something about um, Heron. It runs on Yon, Mesos, and Mesos slash Aroga, and uh, Mesos slash Marathon as well. Then uh, we have Kafka spot in case uh, if anybody wants to go use it outside Twitter. In Twitter, we use this with log and even bug. Then HPC community has contributed for the slur. So if you curious to learn more, uh, we have done three papers, and uh, there are a few more on the way. Uh, so like, uh, you can look up these papers. The popular paper is the one in Merlin. Um, both these these two were uh, submitted at Sigma uh, 2014 and the Sigma 2015. This one is an uh, I think uh, in me. So if you're interested in Heron, go for it. it just open source three months ago. Uh, any contributions if you want to do. Please go ahead and you can follow us at the uh, current streaming if you like. Any question and answers? Yes. Yeah, so another strategy uh -huh. is to shift the work to other nodes. Uh, yes. Add to the workers. <coughs> you have to be careful because if the streaming application has this. So uh, we need to be careful when we shift the work to other nodes. Uh, when the streaming application of the state. Uh, I think so, I could hear you getting close to. Oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> so, another strategy is shift the board to other nodes. Shift the board to? To other nodes. Yes. Right. So, like, uh, other, not the board, but the, I mean, since the container is kind of consists of multiple poles, uh, so the strategy will be to move the container uh, dynamically to from yeah. machine A to yeah. machine B, right? But the thing is, like, uh, somehow we have to identify this. Uh, automated fashion. That's why I mentioned that uh, we have tons of metrics that is coming through these containers today, but uh, those metrics as clearly can indicate which one is going slow. Now, what is the action that you have to take, which is the moving of the container, right? There are two things, identify which container is experiencing slowness, then automatically moving the container. So identifying today is happening manually, but uh, <coughs> you can use uh, some kind of simple uh, rule based as well as what you call them, machine learning kind of algorithms which we have already prototyped and it works, seems to be working reasonably well, but you not put that into production case. Yeah, so I mean, I'm sure that you have looked at the Apache Beam and what Google guys are doing. So you know, they can be able to add more nodes, but you have to be careful because you have to do it basically on the screen partition because there's a state associated with the computation. Uh, so yes. you have to kind of uh, go to a new partition and let that happen. Yeah. Um, so it is tricky to do it, but... Uh, I'm it what is a little bit tricky in the sense like when you have the state, I mean, today like we run stateless, in the sense like because we work on the fact that uh, if a couple fails, we replay the stuff from the source. For, uh, for example, the at least one semantic, okay. right? Okay. So we replace it, uh, replay it so that we will accumulate the state back, yeah. right? Sure. So, so that way, like, uh, what happens is even if the container gets relocated, so the tuples acknowledgement will not reach whatever the tuples that ended up in those guys, right? So then automatically those tuples will be replayed, and uh, that in turn will uh, reconstitute the state for the container. So now uh, uh, we are working on a, a special mechanism where some parts of the state, which was uh, in the bolt and everything, could be saved, for, uh, for which like you need a, some kind of a state story something like uh, probably a key value store, or probably like, uh, what do you call, something like um, uh, a distributor storage in some fashion, but it's fast enough. Hadoop might, might not cut it because, uh, because Hadoop is too small files and you blow up the name node, right? So, so, uh, so like we needed some kind of a decent distributor storage mechanism where the state would be periodically returned and recovered. That will reduce the number, amount of replay that we have to Because if you have the uh, state wise, right? So that is uh, kind of we have started. What we have done is like we have uh, most of is the one who is working on that. So we are using distributed log, which is our distributed uh, messaging system, right? 
So that has a guaranteed, uh, much more better guarantees than Kafka and all other guys. So we are working on a prototype that which can dump the state into the distributed log and redistribute it whenever it needs to. A distributed uh, log runs on Flash and the system. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you for great presentation. Thank you. A couple of questions. You mentioned containers. So is it you mentioned? You mentioned containers. Yes. So is it containers that are turned into Is it the Heron or are you using some like Docker or something? So we use the C group containers, which is at the Linux level, right? So the, whenever you enable us, when you import from the resource, right, we tell them this constitute the container and it should be run as a part of a single C group. Oh, okay. So that's what you're done. And uh, there's nothing that prevents us to run to in Docker also. Because uh, uh, if you look at the, all the various things, it's nothing but a packaging for a Docker. So then all you do is uh, pass some parameters saying to the container, saying that you have to instantiate this many bolts and this many calls, and also what is the role. Because, uh, so like typically the role is uh, given to them dynamically, essentially. So the only thing that we need is how many calls and how many bolts to spawn. Okay, great. And one more. So in a complex topology, uh, what mechanism do you have to discover which ball this creates problem, performance problem? Like if you're struggling because of under under for example, you find just one specific ball that will create a problem. How do you discover this? So like a uh, lot of things I do not have uh, shown it yet. So one thing that we do, uh, the, the containers, there was a one process called metrics management, so which I think we can show that. This one, like there is something called metrics manager, right? So all the instances as well as team manager running in the container are emitting tons and tons of metrics for us. And that includes how many doubles went into one guy, how many came out of one guy, how much latency did they experience, all kind of, uh, I mean, we have a dashboard that runs to pages and pages. So so that, that's all we contributed of, uh, mm -hmm. by the various components that are running, and then return goes to the metrics manager. And that metrics manager goes, comes the metrics to what you call, we have an observability system. And that system where we can look at all the graphs. And so you can, at the every spoke level, every port level, you can have all kind of metrics. So that allows us to troubleshoot uh, any issues about what's happening. And even we exactly know what port is or what spoke is causing the issue also. But it's all manual at this point. So I want to ask three questions. Plus is like for strong we have prepared for at most once and at least once processing. What is the plan for Heron? I didn't see anything. So Heron is at least once and at most once. Always? Yes. Okay. You can, uh, if you have ACK enabled, then it's uh, at least once. If you don't have ACK, it's at most once. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so with this uh, uh, replacing threads with process, we are kind of gone with the local grouping concept or we still have it? So there is a, currently there is no notion of local grouping at this point because uh, one of the things is we want to equally distribute the load. So otherwise some guy, I mean typically what happens is the most of the topologies what you have seen is a shuffle grouping followed by a phase grouping. So even if you make the shuffle grouping, local shuffle grouping fast enough, when it hit the data hits the phase grouping, you are going to slow it down, right? So there is no point in speeding up one part of the graph to slow it down later, right? So that's one of the reasons we thought probably local shuffle grouping might not be needed unless the topology has a shuffle to be followed by shuffle to right? Where you can keep finding a path where you can keep processing rather than trying to use all the paths, right? So for prior use case, it's a requirement that we have to run two bowls or, or let's say that if two bowls are running on the same machine, we have to pass data from one bowl to another bowl. It is uh, the data that is being passed from between those two bowls is increased like 20 times, 100 times. So we want it to the same machine, so we don't put the so load on the network. We don't put this thing on the network, oh, yeah. so which means that is more of a placement. So what we have is when you do the container, right? So in the container, like um, there is something called a packing algorithm that we have. And those packing algorithms basically <coughs> take the topology, and also for each, uh, uh, what you call spoke and both, there's a notion of parallelism that you can attach to it, right? And on those parallelism, you know, the number that you attach, so then you have to pack them into some kind of a bin. And then there's nothing but a bin, right? So how do you pack them? 
So in your case, your constraint is these two bowls kind of thing has to be packed into a single container, right? So you can write your own packing algorithm in Heron and watch it. But, but, but stream manager could pass it to a different node. No, it doesn't have to. Like if you uh, are placing the bowl such a way, okay. then it doesn't. It will bounce off from the stream and they back into the same container. Okay. Last question. So uh, problem with strong, we, we we don't have strong on auto scale. Is uh -huh. that a design specification for Heron? What is it, auto? Auto scale. Like for example, like as gentleman said that they cannot be new nodes automatically added oh, okay, as okay. required. So like uh, here, like if the, cl the cluster, you can keep adding nodes. Now the thing is when the uh, topology uh, want to scale automatically, right? So that is uh, something in the works. Bill is the one who is working on it. So we are almost uh, uh, probably a few weeks away from uh, launching it inside. Uh, so that's coming. So almost we want to wait, uh, give some coverage in production before we push it out. But if there is a PR that is hanging out, we want to take a very detailed Thank you for the round. I have two questions. First of all, you spoke about back pressure. So is there a way uh, where we can induce this back pressure automatically, say, we decide the board should communicate to the stream manager and ask us how to slow down while it's really, is that possible right now? Or Currently it's not. No? Currently it's not. Because the back pressure was, uh, we thought uh, the board cannot induce the back pressure unless it's a user logic, right? Mm -hmm. Instead, uh, we thought the back pressure mechanism should be universal and should be automatically controlled rather than user induced. Right? But is it uh, sufficiently open the interface so that we can do it? Because we have one use case where a board kind of gathers the metrics and based on some metrics it kind of has to slow down the whole process. Uh, if that is, it, it has to slow down or it yeah. has to slow down somebody else? It has to slow down the spout. So the, all, uh, all you have to do is if that uh, data is coming from the spout uh -huh. from the board, you just don't read it. Okay. You just wait for some time, automatically the back pressure will take it. Okay. Yeah, and uh, one more question, uh, is there any uh, neat way to phase in a new topology when we update a topology? Is there a new way to? Uh, a neat way to phase in a new topology. You mean you want to update the existing yeah, topology? Yeah. So, again, it's, it's, so like uh, rather than killing and this thing, yes. right? So, so that is again part of the scaling work. So one of the things in the scaling work is how to keep the existing guy running when you add resources or tear down resources, right? Yeah. As a part of that, if we can kind of what you call you, put a new binary, and uh, what you call kind of uh, ping the one of the, and actually in the containers, uh, there is a, another process, master process called XQ, where we just <coughs> inside of the, what you ping them, so that they can start everything with the new code or whatever. It's possible to do, okay. but if you're not done it yet, yeah. but if you guys are, want to do it, but uh, it's not really hard. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, you have any more questions? Uh, I think we are a little bit, I think we are on time. So, so now uh, Bill and uh, Mosong will uh, give you a hands-on experience on how it looks like. And then, uh, did everybody get a copy of, of the USBs on the computers? Just in case. Where, where is that USB? <laughs> you guys over here already on? Can, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. So uh, I'm Bill Graham, and uh, with Bell Song, we're going to be doing the hands on part of this. Part that's going to help help drive while I talk a bit. Uh, but basically, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, first how to install Heron. We ran into some difficulties with that, with the limited Wi-Fi here, hence we're, we're going with the, uh, the thumb drive. Uh, so hopefully that's making it around because we're going to need that for the first step. So once we get Heron installed on your local machine, uh, then we're going to walk you through how you can launch a topology. So as Karthik showed, there are different schedulers that can be implemented in Heron. Uh, in production, we run on the Aurora scheduler, but we also have a local scheduler. And so running with a local scheduler, you can basically start up the entire stack um, right there on your laptop. Once we have that running, we'll show you how to explore the UI. Uh, you, can, you can see things like what the uh, physical plan looks like, what the logical plan looks like, how to uh, examine the topology as it's running, and troubleshoot, things like that. And then 
And finally, we'll show some references to some additional pro um, projects you could do with Heron, that Heron Starter has some different ideas of, of things you could implement uh, at home uh, as my apologies. And then we'll, we'll wrap up with some, some conclusions. So as we go through this, we've got a Slack channel that you can join. Uh, if, you, if you go to heronusers.herokuapp.com, you can put your, um, your email address in there, you get an invite to join Slack. And then Mao Song is going to be on Slack, so will I in a little bit. Uh, so if you have questions as we go, we'll do our best to answer those on Slack. Or, uh, oh yeah, you know what? <laughs> Forget about the Slack part. Unless you have a Wi-Fi. Unless you have Wi-Fi, yes. We don't have access to the internet unless we get it on the phone. <laughs> and once you have the internet, you can also uh, check out the documentation at heronstreaming.io. All right, so first, to, uh, to install Heron, there are a couple of requirements. Heron requires Java 7. It requires Python 2.7. Uh, if you have those, you should be good to go. If you're going to run on a Linux platform, you're also going to need to manually install Linux one but if you're on a Mac and you've got that version of Java and Python, you should be all set. So, so this is where you would go to download uh, download Heron. What we need for this exercise is the, the Heron client, which is what's used to deploy topologies, as well as uh, in the next slide, the Heron tools, which runs the, the UI and the, and the REST API. I think like these, uh uh, binaries have been provided in the USBs, and all you have to do is copy into a laptop. And uh, in order to install the client binaries, all you have to do is change more that uh, client install for the view of the two dash dot and if you have a uh, flash, uh, it's open to if you have a uh, open machine. Yeah, so uh, so for those of you who have gotten the have gotten the, and also these slides are also available on the thumb drive, so if you're trying to remember this and type all this stuff out, you can just look at the slides. Um, has anybody been able to do this? Has anybody tried to do this who's got the thumb drive? Uh, we'll give it a shot when you have it. Uh, and then I guess what we'll do is we'll go through what it looks like to do this locally. Uh, and we'll show you some local topologies while you guys are hopefully following along. And then we can take a break and, and see if people have questions or, or any, any, any issues. Same thing for the tools. Uh, the tools, like I said, are used for running the UI and the REST API. On that thumb drive, we've got the ones for um, both Ubuntu and for Mac. So this is what it would look like to submit a Heron topology. You, uh, the command is submit local. In this case, it is the local cluster. You can deploy different clusters uh, if you're configured to do so. In this case, we would just run it locally. You pass it the jar that contains the topology. In this case, uh, and then also the, the class name of the jar within the topology, and then whatever you want to call it. This is a, an example topology that we're showing. It's called exclamation topology. It's really simple. It's got one spout that it just emits words. It's got one bolt that listens for that stream of words and it adds exclamation points to the end. Pretty basic, but it, it gets some of the key concepts across of how you can assemble a topology DAG of, of a spout and a bolt in this space. Uh, we've got another one called the, the acting topology example. Same idea, except in this case, the uh, spout, or sorry, the bolt is acting back to the spout. So in that case, you're gonna, that's going to guarantee that you've got the at least one semantics. Without that, you're going to get that much more. And then there's a more complex example, the, the multi-stage acting topology. Same idea, we just stacked two different bolts behind the initial spouts to show what a graph would look like with multiple stages of acting all going back up through the chain. So once you have that running, then you can run the Heron tracker uh, with, with this command, Heron-tracker. When you install with that library with dash dash user, everything is going to go into the, the, the bin directory under your home directory. So you'll start the tracker, start the UI, and once you have that, now you've got the topology running, you can go and examine the topology using the UI. 
uh, and we'll show you what that looks like based on it. Oh yeah, so is anybody else still looking for, looking for the uh, So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on under the covers when you launch a topology. Uh, this kind of speaks to what Karthik was showing earlier of how Heron is architected. There are a lot of different processes with different responsibilities. And understanding what's going on under the covers helps to troubleshoot when things don't work right. So basically when, uh, when the Heron, when the submitter submits a topology using the client, the first thing they would do in, um, in a production topology is it goes to an uploader which uploads the jar file to uh, what we call the topology, sto topology storage service. In this case, since it's mobile, it just keeps it locally. So now the jar is available to be deployed on the cluster. Then the submit command goes to a process called the launcher, again, still running on the client. The launcher sets the logical plan on the state manager, and it sets the execution state, basically registering this topology with the state manager and its, its logical plan. Once that's registered on the state manager, the launcher can then go ahead and schedule it on a scheduler. This is the portable scheduler I was talking about earlier. In this case, we've got a local scheduler. First thing the scheduler process does when it starts, it registers its location with the state manager. The state manager I'm talking about in a production environment, in our case, is the zookeeper, which I would uh, imagine most people will be running with. Locally, when you run these, uh, the state manager is a file system state manager, so we just keep all the same uh, zookeeper node data in a local file, or a local uh, directory tree. So once we've got the location registered, the scheduler fetches the artifact from the storage topology and starts the process of, uh, of launching these processes on the different on the containers. So the first thing, so what it does is it launches the executor, with, which Karth mentioned earlier. Every node has an executor, and that executor is really the key process that's responsible for starting up all the processes on that container that that container is responsible for. And during the life cycle of all those processes, the executor is the one who listens to make sure that those processes are still running. If anything fails, the executor starts it up again. If that container dies and gets redeployed somewhere else, the first thing that comes up is the executor, and it goes back to work making sure that all the making sure that that container is in the, in the correct state. So the executor, when, when it starts, the first thing it does on, uh, on container zero, container zero, if you remember, Karthi mentioned, is the one that runs a topology master. So it starts a T master and it's container zero. If it's on one of the other containers, uh, one through N, it's going to start a stream manager, first of all, and then it's going to start all the different faults and spouts which we, we call instances. And then finally, it's going to start a metrics manager. Uh, that runs on all the other containers, zero, zero through one. So if we go back to the T-Master, the T-Master, the first thing it does, it starts up, it registers its location with the state manager. This is so that all the other uh, state manager, sorry, it registers uh, the state manager so that all the other stream managers are able to uh, locate it when, they, when they're ready to. Likewise, uh, so now if we go back to the specific instances, the, uh, the instances start up, they register themselves with their stream manager. The stream manager knows all the instances that it should be responsible for on its container. Once all those instances are started, the stream manager knows that it's good to go and it's got everything running that it needs to run. Then the stream manager goes back and it registers itself with the T master. Likewise, T master knows all the stream managers it's responsible for. Once they've all registered, now the team master knows I've got a good topology. All the instances are registered, all the, all the stream managers are registered, and now I'm the topology master, I'm ready to start this thing up and, and start emitting um, some buttons. Once that happens, the team master, it's gonna, it now knows the physical plan of the entire topology, all the different uh, hosts and ports of every one of the instances and every one of the stream managers. It will, it will register that, that back in the state manager. So now the full physical state of the system is stored. Now that that's the case, T-Master can go back to the stream manager and say, all right, we're ready, to, we're ready to go into active mode. Here's the physical plan that you all need to know about so that you can start passing tuples between yourselves uh, 
and then ultimately to the, the instances. And so then at that point, the stream manager, uh, stream managers are ready to start sending and receiving tuples. All the tuples on a given container processed by an instance, they all are sent and received through the local stream manager, which is basically the, the traffic cop then delegating those tuples off in other containers. Now that you've got a running topology in this case, uh, the metrics manager is collecting metrics on each one of these containers. It's pushing these metrics back to the team master. Everything goes through the team master in that case. So now you've got uh, the tracker, which is our uh, REST API. It's able to get the metrics from the team master. It periodically pulls the team masters to keep fresh all the different metrics that it's holding. And then from the Heron UI, the Heron UI can now go to back to the state manager here to get all the topologies that are running in the system. And then for each one, uh, it can go back to, to Tracker to get those metrics that the Tracker is now part of. That's how you're going to see metrics on the UI when we bring that up in a minute. Uh, and then at the bottom, I've got some, just a, uh, some details about the flow for how a topology might get deactivated or reactivated. Uh, likewise, when we do a scaling event that we were talking about earlier, if we're going to increase parallelism, it would also go for a similar path. And basically, from the client, they can make a call to the launcher, which makes a, a deactivate command back to the team master. The team master uh, tells all the screen managers that they should be deactivated, which in this case is basically telling them all to, to pause sending and receiving any tuples for a period. Uh, and then that command returns back to the user. So that's how we have control over starting and stopping the various life cycle events that we have. On the team master. Any questions about this before I before I move on? There's kind of a lot here. Yeah. So why don't we um, why don't we bring up the demo? If I could, you want to bring up? So I'm just going to bring up the UI and I'll show you some of the things that I was just. Tracker is basically a, uh, a REST API that's serving JSON to the, the Heron UI. And this is the Heron UI. I mean, Heron UI and Heron Tracker are written using Python. Then you open up the window. Here, so this is the simplest one panel. Yeah. Uh, so you can see the topology as we define if we can have to that also we have two stages. One is the word, another is the it's coming. So it's very simple, the word will emit tuples. And the tuples will come from the tuples to receive and also it will add summation to the end of the word. So See here, we have uh, a, a, some circle in that was the status of this different metrics. For example, capacity. Green means it's pretty good at all. And this is also have some time chain metrics. For example, you can have how many CPU used, and how many memory used, and what's the GC time. So the UI is very powerful. For example, you can have a look config here. Because this project does not have any extra config, so it's empty. 
And also, we want to make people to get rid of head of all those physical information head of. You can just debug or explore a topology on the UI itself. For example, for this, if we want to uh, have a look, see if it has only one instance, we want to have a look at this status. For example, we can have a look at this logs. We don't have two SSH2 applications. We don't need to have some other Linux line to open up. We just click this button, and then we can open the logs here. Similarly, you can do open the jobs. You can see this. It was informed, for example, you have all of metrics, more you know, metrics here. You can see all of this information here. And what's more, you can do kind of sort exceptions, PID, stack, memory, keep down kind of here, just on the UI. We may provide more features on the UI because we want people just use the UI can handle them all the easily. Here has some physical location of the technology. It has only one container, and together it has two instances. One is this, the yellow one is the spot, and the blue one is the destination. So this is pretty much what you are. And here we have some summary of some main metrics. We provide much more metrics than this in my class of points here. We just mentioned some key metrics. For example, for this boat, we just kill those much in last 10 minutes, in last one hour, three hours, or all time. Because we just do not, or we do not enable acting. So this ad count, fail count, they are zero. And this latency is super fast. For the unit is MS, so it's zero. But if you convert to head of nanosecond, it is also a number. So similarly, if, if, uh, this is the basic example of one topology, you can click different. This is the class name, and you, if you click to other topology, you can see similar things after sim a similar data information for other topologies. They are all in the same way. It's making you easier to debug and to get so, yeah. Hello? The system level information that you have, like CPU and Max PC and all those things, yes. is that matrix configurable? Oh, uh, what do you mean by matrix? Like, for example, if I want to have network over there. Oh, no, 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 that is not connected. Currently, it's all fixed with the UA right now. Okay. So the, yeah. the UA is kind of uh, not connected. No, but, but matrix manager is configurable. Can I start getting mm -hmm. network statistics for yes, my machine? Yes, that yes. How much network attention is there? Yes. For example, if you not use yeah. the okay. Yes. Okay. And also, you can have, uh, you can add, uh, in fact, you can also add your specific, uh, your customized thing. How to handle those metrics. For example, here, if you have a look at this config, you can see a metrics thing, YAML. Here, we enable file sync. That means we will write all those metrics to file in JSON format. Also, we have a TMR sync, which feeds the data of the checker. So here, you have different config. You can specify your sync estimated indication. You could define your way to handle those metrics. And here is a sample of the file sync results. As you see, it is called, uh, it's in JSON format. If you in a, uh, install a JSON plugin, you install in a pretty format. It, you can see it is more tons of metrics here, much more than we saw on the UI. So we, have, we can write our own UI to collect stuff. Yes. Yeah. The tracker yes. provides a generic JSON API, JSON API, yes. and you can buy that UI. Yes. yes. You can also customize your thing to define how to handle those metrics. Very easy. Questions? Yeah, we're good. A few more slides. Yeah, so what that's all showing how in the UI you can see the logical plan, the physical plan, storing different uh, dashboard functionalities, viewing the metrics, process logs, exceptions, a lot of functionality. So if you're interested in doing some other demo projects, there are some uh, further examples on that GitHub URL, uh, the GitHub project with Carthix. There's some examples you can look at there. There are also some exercises you can do here. You can, uh, you know, you can tie it as a fire hose and implement your own, your own example for how maybe you're going to do uh, 
you know, popular terms in tweets or popular hashtags or top retweeters for a given tag. All pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward things to implement on top of our own. And yeah, and that's it. Uh, and you you want to play it? You want to play it? You have to. Yeah. Question. In some systems, so it's essentially cascading, which is you know, it's the group jobs because it's batch processing the data flows, but if they have uh, a way to run it essentially embedded, and that's really great to be lucky. Is there anything equivalent to that for her? Uh, yeah, so you've got the local mode here, but then we also have what we call the simulator. And so in simulator mode, you, you could run basically a topology running through uh, simulated in your own in your own environment. So essentially, you can run the whole thing in ID where you're not. Yeah, you can run the whole thing in a trivia process. You can run the full benefit of a process in local process. You can run the whole simulator allows you to run the whole topology in a single JVM process, then you can enjoy the benefits of single JVM process. For example, you can run it in IBM. You can set a great point. You can add it the value in one time and anything you want. Well, if there are any other questions, if there are folks who are willing to try it, uh, we can hang out for a little bit and help people get set up if you're curious to give a shot, or if you want to try it on your own, best, best way to get help and reach us is on the, the, we've got a Google Groups mailing list, the Heron users list is a good one to join, uh, and like I said earlier in the docs, we're on at heronstream.io. So, repeat, uh, Oh yeah, that's right, you, you, can, uh, <laughs> you can follow Heron streaming and tweet at us as well.